everyone this is video number one of the regents chemistry curriculum in this video we are going to organize matter into different categories and distinguish between isomers isotopes and allotropes so uh, let's get started right away by the end of this video you should be able to answer these questions you can pause the video and see if you know how to answer them now all right here are some major concepts you should be familiar with. Matter, anything that has mass and has volume. If it wastes something and it occupies a space, it is an example of matter. So you are an example of matter. The food you eat, the water you drink, the air you breathe. These are all examples of matter. Matter is classified into two major categories, substances and mixtures. So let's have two cabinets here. In one cabinet, I'm going to have substances, S for substances. In the other cabinet, I'm going to have mixtures, M for mixtures. Let's read a little more. Substances, what are they? Elements, compounds, or pure substances. Remember the acronym ECAPS. Elements and compounds are pure substances. So I'm going to have one shelf here for elements, one shelf here for compounds. Okay. There are two main types of compounds. I'm going to separate this shelf. So this is the compounds shelf. This is the elements shelf. There are two main types of compounds. These are ionic and molecular. And there are, and we can classify elements into two types as well. Monatomic, mono for one atom, atomic, diatomic, di for two, atom, atomic, So, let's talk a little more about these. Diatomic elements are elements that exist in identical pairs. If we remember Brinkelhoff, we know all the diatomic elements on the periodic table. Monatomic elements are simply all the other elements on the periodic table. Now, ionic compounds versus molecular compounds. Here's the periodic table. It contains all the elements you should be familiar with. <clears throat> I'm going to point you out to this staircase here. This is the staircase of the metalloids. So anything above and below except alpo, aluminum, and polonium is considered a metalloid. And metalloids are simply a combination of, they have characteristics of metals and non-metals. So everything on the left side here, highlighted in green, let me just remove that germanium, so all these elements highlighted in green are examples of metalloids and all these elements highlighted in red are examples of nonmetals. Why did I talk about that is because I wanted to show you the difference between molecular compounds and ionic compounds. If you mix any of those green or any of those metals on the left side highlighted in green with non-metals highlighted in red, you'll form what we call an ionic compound. Most common one, NaCl. Na is a metal. Here it is. Cl is a non-metal. Here it is. If you if you want to make a molecular compound, obviously you'll have to mix 
two non-metals together, so carbon and oxygen will make carbon dioxide. That will give you a molecular compound. Moving along. Some more information about elements and compounds. Elements cannot be broken down by any means. So if you have a piece of copper and you try to crush it or hammer it down, you're always going to have copper, just smaller pieces of copper. Each element has unique a uh, unique density. Let's take a look at table S. Here are the element symbols. Here are the element names. This is the temperature in Kelvin at which they melt. This is the temperature in Kelvin at which they boil. Here is their densities. Their atomic radius, the radius of the atoms that make up the elements. Density is considered an identifier of an element. So if I'm talking about the element gold, I can go to table S, I can measure the density of gold, and if the density of the gold is equal to 19.3, I know I have real gold in my hands. Compounds are two or more different elements combined chemically in fixed proportions. Very important that we understand what fixed proportions are. Here's an example. If you want to make water, you need two atoms of hydrogen and only one atom of oxygen to combine together chemically. If you have two atoms of hydrogen and two atoms of oxygen, you will not get water. You'll get hydrogen peroxide. If you drink hydrogen peroxide, you may put your life at risk. If you drink water, nothing would really happen to you. We'll talk more about electrolysis in the next video. Compounds will always be homogeneous because particles will always be uniformly distributed in compounds. So if you were to draw the compound dihydrogen monoxide, also known as water, dihydrogen for two hydrogens, monoxide, mono for one, oxide for oxygen, it would look like this, two hydrogens, one oxygen. And every compound of water will have that same uniform arrangement of particles. It will always be two hydrogens, white circles, one oxygen, blue circle. Isotopes. Let's take a look at the periodic table. Let's try to get rid of all of this. So the number of protons equals the number of the atom. Chromium is number 24. It has 24 protons inside its nucleus. Nickel is number 28. It has 28 protons inside its nucleus. This is the mass of the atom in a decimal form. The mass of the atom is the average mass of all that 
elements isotopes. So if I was thinking about nickel, maybe I'll have nickel 58. Maybe I'll have a bigger atom, nickel 59. Maybe I'll have nickel 60. The average mass of all these atoms, atom 1, atom 2, atom 3, equals to the atomic mass of nickel. Going on. How to calculate the atomic mass? Percent over 100 times mass plus percent over 100 times mass of isotope B, isotope C, isotope D, and so on. Here's an example. We can calculate the atomic mass of carbon by following that same method. 97 over 100 is the percentage times mass. In this case, it's 12 plus 2 percentage over 100 times 13, the mass, plus 1 over 100 times the mass, 14. Find your answer here, find your answer here, find your answer here, add them all together, and you'll get your atomic mass. Okay. We talked about substances. We talked about that first cabinet, which contains the elements and the compounds, the monatomic, the diatomic elements, the ionic, the molecular compounds. Now we're going to talk about the second cabinet, the mixtures cabinet. In the mixtures cabinet, there are only two shelves the homogeneous mixtures and the heterogeneous mixtures. Homogeneous mixtures will have uniform and consistent particle arrangements, but the proportions of particles may vary. If you have a container and you have salt in it, you put one tablespoon of salt in water, you'll get salty water. You put 10 tablespoons of salt in water, you're still gonna get salty water. So the proportions can vary. Water is the universal solvent. Uniform distribution of particles is definitely associated with the term homogeneous. AQ stands for aqueous, which means dissolved in water. If you see this, automatically know that you're talking about a homogeneous mixture. Mixture, mixture, mixture. Why is sand and water heterogeneous? Because sand never really dissolves in water. And you'll always be able to see sand and water. Allotropes versus isomers. Okay, so the element oxygen can exist as a diatomic element and it can also exist as a triatomic element. O2, oxygen gas, and O3, ozone, are considered allotropes. Yes, they are both are made of oxygen, but they have different properties. Isomers. Similarly, 
or similar to allotropes, isomers are compounds. They both have the same chemical formula. Take, for example, dimethyl ether. We have two carbons, six hydrogens, one oxygen. And for ethanol, we also have two carbons, six hydrogens, and one oxygen. The chemical formula is the same, but their structures are different. Here, I have oxygen trapped between two carbons to form an ether. Here, I have oxygen trapped between hydrogen and carbon to form an alcohol. How did I know that was an ether and how did I know that was an alcohol? I looked at table R. An ether is when an oxygen is trapped between a carbon chain and a different carbon chain. The letter R represents a carbon chain. An alcohol is when an, is when an oxygen is trapped between a hydrogen atom and a carbon chain. So different functional groups One of them is an ether functional group, while the other one is an alcohol functional group. We'll give you different structures and different physical and chemical properties. That's it for today's lesson. If you have any questions, please consult with your peers in class while uh, the teacher will be supervising you and helping you out along the way. Here are the questions that we started with. Try to answer them now, pause the video and try to answer them now. See if any of those statements is true or false. Write down your answers and uh, write down the questions as well. Make sure you have some notes down and uh, get ready to perform some laboratory activities in class or answer more complex uh, chemistry questions with your teachers and your peers. Good luck!